So the second one that you probably read about the most in the newspaper, this is probably the most common one that we see, is the observational study. And in the observational study, the researcher basically just sits back and collects data on subjects who are already divided into groups. So the researcher collects data on the subjects of the test who are already divided into groups. Whether by choice, uh, let's see, so by choice or just circumstance. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we want to do research, the effects that smoking has on, um, smoking mothers have on newborn babies, uh, we might be constrained. It wouldn't be ethical to assign a treatment of smoking to one group of uh, mothers and assign not smoking to another group of mothers. As you can imagine, that would cause a stirring, right? There's some ethical constraints there. So in an obs we would be forced to do an observational study in that way, where we uh, look at mothers who are already choosing to smoke and mothers who are choosing not to smoke. We can't assign a treatment because that wouldn't be ethical. What do I mean by circumstance? Well, what if we wanted to do a study on whether um, blue-eyed people were more sensitive to light than brown-eyed people. Well, I'm blue-eyed, but I didn't choose to be blue-eyed, and you couldn't assign blue eyes to me. It's just the circumstance that I was born into, right? Mm -hmm. So whether by choice or by circumstance, these populations are already divided into two groups that will compare parallel to each other. So, um, with the same scenario that we were working on before, the same theory that you have uh, that studying in the library is better than studying in your dorm room, an observational study would take 50 students who choose to regularly study in the library. That's where they, that's where they always go. It's just part of their routine. So 50 students who choose to study in the UGL regularly. So that would be, we would still call that our treatment group. Even though we didn't really assign a treatment to them, they're still considered the treatment group because they're undergoing this treatment that we're considering throughout the study. We want to know the effects of studying in the library. They're the ones who've chosen to undergo the treatment. And who are we going to compare that to? It's our comparison group, which would be you know, 50 students who choose to regularly study in their dorms. Now, the problem here, and so then what we would do here is, just like before, we would compare the differences uh, in test scores across these two groups. Um, now, why would we choose to do this? Because, as I said before, we could start this study out and the scales might not be even. There are most likely other differences between these two groups than just the studying uh, location, right? Because we didn't, the researcher didn't assign, these students chose to assign, uh, chose to study where they, they study. They probably are also making other differences and choices throughout their lives between the two groups. So odds are the treatment and comparison group are probably not the same in every other way. So this is definitely more flawed than our controlled experiment. So why would any researcher bother with an experiment that's flawed? Why is that the one that we see most commonly in the newspaper? And the answer is this is much easier. Can you imagine setting up an experiment and controlling 100 U of I students, having to assign them to groups and having to follow up with them and make sure that they're really sticking with their treatment, sticking with their control, and following up on these two divided groups? That's a lot of balls up in the air. That's a lot to handle. What's easier often is just to observe what's already going on. That's, that's the easiest way to observe science, is just through what's already occurring in nature. So that's why we would say that overall, the observational studies are flawed 
but they're easier. And again, they're flawed because we can't assure ourselves that any difference that we see between these two groups is only, only because of this treatment. There could be other differences as well because these participants decided which group to be in or the two or they or just by circumstance were in different groups already. So do you understand how this is definitely a flawed uh, study but it is easier and that's why it's the more common one that we see. Any questions on this? And the main point to get across is that the best data that we can get, the best data that is collected, is data where the two groups, our treatment group and our comparison group, are as equal as possible, as similar as possible, identical in every other way. And the best way to assure that these are not uh, uneven, unequal, or to assure that there's no bias involved is to have a researcher randomly divide. That randomization is the best way to remove human bias and make sure that these two groups come out on an even playing field. So as you're going to hear in lecture, randomization is really key to a perfect study if you would want to find one. So, uh, overall, in this next lecture that you're coming to, you're going to learn about experimental, uh, controlled experiments and the many different uh, varieties of, the, of controlled experiments. You're also going to learn about observational studies, the strengths and weaknesses of both, and hopefully you'll come out with a good understanding about which studies are strong and which studies are weak. I have one question. And one question, yes. So, um... When you do the uh, controlled experiment, you might end up making people study in the library who don't want to study in the library, right? That's right. That's right. The controlled experiment, because the people are assigned, the result is that some people might be outside of their comfort zone. Some people who are assigned to the library might love it, but also some people who are assigned to the library might hate it. So, and then the same thing with the dorm. So in that way, you're really removing the element of choice there, the element of comfort, so that any difference we saw between those two groups, we couldn't just pin on studying where you're comfortable is the best way to succeed on an exam. That really we're pinning it on the environment. It's not studying where you believe you study best. It's not studying where you feel the most comfortable. It's studying in X environment is best. Studying in Y environment is best.